I'm aware that uh, this is kind of a different talk than many of you uh, have um, in terms of your work. Um, what I'm going to do today is um, share some of my recent data and ideas about my research in molecular autism. Uh, what I have here is a bunch of pictures that cover some of the work I do. The first picture is a picture of some beautiful mitochondria. And then the next two pictures are pictures of, of neurons. And then the last picture is a sign that's used recently by adult autistics used to represent autism. And so I'll come to the idea of how adult autistics have been advocating for themselves and there's been a real paradigm shift on how we talk, view, and represent autism. So that sign is the preferred sign that adult autistics prefer uh, to be used and it's the infinity sign. All right, so I'm gonna start, um, page down. Okay, so I've got quite a complex talk today. I want to cover different aspects of my research because it's been a real journey. And this is a bit of a roadmap to help you see where we're at. The bulk of my talk will be blue-headed slides, and that's where I'll talk about my molecular data. I'll start off with an introduction, and those are the purpley kind of slides about a general introduction just to orientate you um, into my kind of thinking and my kind of world. And then I'll talk to you about the phenotype, autism. And I'll end off, if we have time, about the psychopathology and trying to bridge the gap between uh, molecular biology and the psychopathology and what really matters to autistic individuals. All right, so we all know that we have been part of a large natural experiment. We had no choice, we were signed up. And so the COVID pandemic was an incredible natural social experiment. And one of the things about the COVID pandemic was the mental health cost and the social cost of COVID. And there are many other costs associated with COVID that I won't talk about. But if you look at the picture on the far left, that shows you the cases of mental conditions that rose sharply during the pandemic. The, pandemic. the green is major depressive disorder and the blue is anxiety disorder. So we can see that millions of people reported um, these conditions to the healthcare practitioners. If you look at the next um, panel of, of, of data, you can see that um, we look at people with these uh, mental phenotypes by age, and you can see that younger people were harder hit. And if we look at the last panel, we can see women were hit harder than men. So this highlights as a segue into autism as how much humans are a social species, how much we need physical touch, social interactions, and we need facial cues that were hidden by the masks we wore for two or three years. And so that in mind, we know that autism is a condition that's characterized by social difficulties. And if we want to know how many individuals in South Africa are autistic, and we have no idea. We have very little research on autism at every level in South Africa. It is increasing. And so the prevalence of autism and the increase of the recognition of autism comes from numbers from the USA. And as you can see from the graph, that the numbers are as high as one in 44. And that refers to what is the latest diagnosis of autism in the DSM, which is autism spectrum disorder, which is defined, it's called ASD, and it's defined by two difficulties, or clinically, as it's referred to as, um, as uh, deficits um, in two core domains, the social communication and social interaction, and the second domain being restrictive and repetitive behaviours. And so the DSM was relatively recently revised. It's only in its fifth edition. Um, the previous edition of um, the DSM had um, language as one of the, de the deficits. And so this resulted in this broader kind of basket of conditions under one umbrella, which is autism spectrum disorder. And this is what mainly, uh, I think, accounts for the prevalence is this increased recognition, diagnosis, and the broader uh, diagnostic criteria for autism which has resulted in this increase, this apparent increase of perhaps one in 100, all the way up to one in 44 in the USA. So most people 
people think they know what autism is and what autism looks like. I mean, people think of the autism spectrum, they think of the picture on the left. They think that it's a, a scale of one monolithic trait that is less severe going to more severe or less challenging going to more challenging. And that is not what autism looks like. Autism is this complex collection of numerous traits, which each have a complex kind of combinatorial uh, output. And so what autism really looks like, if one looks at language, for example, as one domain within the autism uh, collection of traits, uh, and the lighter color being uh, less challenges to the brighter shade of yellow being more challenges, you can see that autism, any individual, could be any combination of, of, of challenges. And so it comes to this old fashioned idea is that, which is, I, I don't know who it's attributed to, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And so you'll hear me talk about autism today. You'll hear me talk about autism spectrum disorder, which is the DSM uh, cl clinical kind of uh, moniker. And you'll also hear me talk about autism spectrum conditions. And this will tie into the work I'll talk at the end, where it's seen less as a disorder by healthy functioning individuals with autism and more as just a condition and a different way of operating. And that's not to say some individuals with autism have severe difficulties. And there's even some debate in the literature of talking about profound autism um, to, to, to differentiate these individuals. And so autism is incredibly complex. It's varied. It's a combination of quantitative traits and it has numerous comorbidities. So what do I mean by complex? Well, there are some ASD conditions that are called syndromic autism uh, conditions where they are underpinned by a single genetic mutation. And an example might be fragile X where we know the gene mutation, yet we have this varied expression of this mutation in terms of the phenotype. However, in spite of autism being highly heritable, most autisms and most people with ASD, it's, we don't know the genetic underpinning. It is idiopathic, we don't know. It's varied, and this is very banal, but it's varied. Some individuals would have very good language, but high repetitive behaviors. Um, other individuals have no language, uh, at all, no spoken language, yet have very low levels of repetitive um, behaviors. It's clearly a combination of a range of quantitative traits. And just to remind you, of course, you know what quantitative traits. It isn't an on-off. It isn't tall or short. It's every single combination of height in between, to use that example. To continue with that example, if you look at body shapes and types, where you have lean people and muscular people and something more in between, you can look at the range of body types we have. And so it's incredibly, every trait that contributes to autism is quantitative. And then autism spectrum disorder uh, overlaps with a number of comorbidities or other conditions that have a separate diagnosis. And this includes things like OCD, uh, uh, anxiety disorder, but it also includes a range of other traits that people are starting to recognize, like sleep disorders, uh, gut problems like constipation, fecal loading, uh, IBS. Uh, um, autism is also associated with epilepsy. There's a strong link with epilepsy. So one can see how difficult it would be to diagnose an individual with autism and to perhaps manage the lifelong disabilities and challenges that comes with autism. And so I'm gonna stop the introduction here about autism generally and give you a really interesting story. And this story uh, ties into the idea that when we see, when we look at autism, we have a range of individuals with autism who have average to above average intelligence, who are completely functionally normal society, albeit with some challenges. So I'll tell you this cautionary trail of the Spectrum 10K study. The Spectrum 10K study was a United Kingdom-based study, the largest study to date that aimed to investigate uh, the genetic environmental factors that contribute to autism in order to look at people's mental and physical health conditions and understand the well-being of autistic people and their families. So this last phrase is very important because it talks about very noble outcomes of helping autistic individuals and their families uh, 
both their mental and physical health by collecting 10,000 genomes. This project was the largest project of its kind in the UK. It was a project that took years to put together. It was a project that collected some of the best brains and research minds in the UK across four or five top institutions. And this, um, this study was launched in August 2021. Less than a month later, the study was stopped because autistic individuals in the community felt that the study had not included them, had not consulted them about what needed to be done. The study was not described or explained to these, to this community. Um, and you can read the details on the slide and it's all over um, the internet and various social media platforms. But what basically happened is a groundswell of individuals asked people to boycott the autism 10K study. The study pivoted on collecting data using the internet, asking people to uh, send in samples of saliva and then you know, have subsequent things. And so the study currently is still in phase three consultation of talking to people in this community that are an important part of both the problems that we're trying to solve and the solution. And this brings me to a very important idea in autism research, but in all uh, clinical uh, research, it has a neurological or neuropsychiatric um, phenotype, and that is participatory research. And many of us are unfamiliar with this idea of participatory research, as am I, I'm learning. And as somebody who had to work at the coalface of recruiting a cohort, um, one other than ethics from one's university, you have to go into the community because I worked in a community-based context and you have to consult with stakeholders. I had to consult with teachers, with psychologists, with parents, with school boards before going into the schools. Your study was um, scrutinized. Um, informed parental consent was important. Informed participant a consent was important from, from, from the participants who were minors. And then the big thing was that the schools that I worked with were quite fatigued. They had some sort of research overload of everybody working in these schools and not getting anything back. So people did sort of sometimes report back the, the results. But what this um, paper, and there's the reference for anybody that's interested, is that real participatory research is really an intentional choice in terms of the questions you ask, the methods you use, the tools you use, how you involve stakeholders, and how you empower stakeholders. And that Spectrum 10K study describes how important this is. And this has become um, important in my research as well. And I'll speak a little bit about that um, toward the end. And so when I started my research journey, I started by looking at the epigenetics of autism. And so it's quite clear genetics, uh, autism is a highly heritable um, phenotype, that genetics are important and so are epigenetics. And as we know, this audience knows that epigenetics is a normal, important process, particularly important in development. But methylation or epigenetics was first highlighted as a really important player in autism when a seminal study showed that identical twins, that is the same DNA sequences, were discordant, i.e. different for the autism phenotype. Um, the study looked at 50 pairs of twins, where some twins met criteria, and some pairs, one twin met criteria for autism and the other didn't, or they both met criteria for autism and one had more profound challenges than the other. And they showed amongst, between these twin sets, that DNA methylation patterns were different. And this, 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 pattern of methylation was recapitulated in a number of subsequent studies, including studies where they looked at postmortem brain tissue and they could show methylation differences that correlated with expression differences and specifically in the prefrontal cortex. And so with that in mind, this is where I start on my research. And you can see from the roadmap, we're in the blue part. And so um, one of the things that I'm very keen on is that I work across a number of different levels. Um, I work, if you look at the, at the figure on the, on the left, um, I'm looking, I will be looking at, at epigenetics, the DNA methylation tags, um, 
Um, we know that DNA is translated into RNA. We've just recently completed an RNA seq study on our cohort, and that data has been analyzed at the moment. And uh, we're doing no protein protein interaction work, but we are very keen on taking the data that's out there and trying to combine it to see what is the convergent signal across different orders of data sets. And once we get all of that, we're actually looking at people. And because I had to build a cohort, I started my research literally from scratch, and I intuitively had to take a particip participatory research approach because I wasn't working in a clinical setting, but in a community setting. I consulted with parents of children, uh, parents of younger children with autism and older teenagers. These discussions were all organic. But after the Spectrum 10K study, I realized I had to be more intentional about my participatory research. And part of my trying to do that is uh, my, my, my group has a website, so I encourage you to look at it. We try and put on research blogs that are informative to people who aren't specialists and specifically demystify some of the misconceptions about what DNA samples can and can't do and what molecular research can and can't do, all the time keeping in mind what we think the autistic community wants and would like us to research. Um, and so I have started some initiatives where I'm trying to engage with adults with autism. It's a work in progress, and I can't give you too much data on, on, on those projects yet. We're still speaking with some individuals in the autism community about what modality of engagement they'd like before we can even ask some of the questions we'd like to ask. So this takes me to my first study. Um, which was published in, I think, 2020. And this was a DNA methylation study. So it's quite clear that there's a strong genetic component to autism. And there are numerous studies, both past and ongoing, where people are looking at SNP data and whole genome sequencing to find genetic loci associated with autism. However, these loci are common SNPs that each only have a tiny, tiny contribution to autism. And the seminal uh, methylation paper I spoke to you about suggested that methylation was important in autism. And indeed, it's important in a range of neuropsychiatric conditions. And so the approach I took was a case control approach where I looked at individuals who had an autism diagnosis. And I confirmed those, that diagnosis by using the research goal standard, an autism uh, research tool and the clinical tool, it's called the ADOS2, to confirm that the children at the schools with autism indeed met criteria in a research context for autism. And as you can see, they're all shades of blue and gray because no two individuals with autism were the same. And what I did was unusual for the time, the papers at the time, and unusual for the study in South Africa. I also looked at the individuals without autism um, and made sure they did not have, they did not meet criteria for autism. So this study was a whole genome study where I looked at the methylation sites across the genome to look at which genes were differentially methylated. I did not have endless cash or endless time. It took me, as Laura put out, it was a hard slog. It took me about four years to build this cohort from absolute scratch. And so I decided to kind of uh, reduce the phenotypic complexity of my cohort. So I only recruited boys. And the reason for that was that Autism is much more prevalent. There's a four to one ratio of male to female for autism for what it's worth, although women probably had autism at the same rate, but the tools don't pick it up. And at the time, uh, the, the, the women or the females with autism tend to have more copy number variants and what is called a higher genetic load associated with autism. So for that reason, I chose boys only, pre-pubital pre boys, because obviously methylation tags are quite um, sensitive to hormonal fluctuations. And I did a case control and we had um, a biothematic pipeline. I've got some data at the end if people want to ask me about that. And we ended up with about 800 differentially methylated genes associated with autism. And these genes on their own didn't say much. I will remind you that one of my top, my top differentially methylated genes was a gene called Stommel. And I will come back to this gene called Stommel. Um, but what we did was we analyzed these genes in a pathway approach. We use ingenuity pathway analyses, and we found 13, 14 canonical pathways associated with autism. 
The cellular location of these pathways are mostly in the mitochondria, and these pathways were all metabolic pathways. And so what I did is try and spend, first of all, I spent many sleepless nights trying to understand why did I not find the genes that many papers published at the time were finding, which were papers involved in neurotransmission and neural ligands and synaptic function. Instead, all my pathways, when I analyzed them in a sort of synthetic way, they all occurred in the mitochondria and they were all implicated in mitochondrial function and specifically ATP production. Although a couple of the pathways were involved in fatty acid metabolism, not shown here, and it was actually shown here, and it was in protein deprotonation. And so all the genes in color are the genes I found were differentially methylated. And you can see they all implicate ATK, ATP production. Um, because this was a chip based, you know study with a bioinformatic um, kind of pipeline. I had to validate indeed that those genes that I found were differentially methylated were differentially methylated. So in a larger replication cohort, I validated about 30 genes using target next gene for sulfate sequencing and a couple of highlighted special genes I used DNA power sequencing. Just to go back one slide, sorry. I want you to focus on a gene in purple at the bottom half of the of the of the cycle, and it's called PCCB. And that gene PCCB is quite central in, uh, in some of the work we're taking further. So I just want you to draw your attention to PCCB. I'm not sure if my, no, maybe my cursor is working there. That's PCCB. And so, because that was such a central gene in our mind, it was involved in three canonical pathways. We also quantitatively, in a locus-specific manner, examined, um, validated this gene using DNA pyrosequencing. And we focused on a region of the promoter, and we could find in a CPG site-specific manner that um, this gene was differentially methylated between the case and control. And very specifically, we could show that this region included a putative binding site for a transcription factor, and that was P53. So that was very exciting for us. And so PCCB is a critical enzyme, as I said, in three canonical pathways, and its methylation has decreased um, in ASD. And so we needed some functional data to convince the reviewers our data was real from the tip of Africa. And so I collaborated with some scientists from the University of Northwest who work on um, mitochondrial disorders or respiratory dysfunction in South African children with mitochondrial diagnosable clinical mitochondrial disease. And they set up an assay using metabolomics, using mass spec, um, uh, and they managed to set up a method where they used urinary urine and they could extract organic acids because the gold standard for diagnosing mitochondrial diseases in young, young, young newborn children is a skin biopsy, which is clearly quite invasive. And we found that our children with autism, our cohort, had the same metabolites present as children who had the mitochondrial disease. Not the whole collection of metabolites, but three specific metabolites. And interestingly, these metabolites were involved in the catabolism of branched amino acids, which feed into the mitochondria and into the TCA cycle. And these branched amino acids are particularly sensitive to um, ATP production and ROS imbalances. So we could show through a bio, through a methylation screen and a bioinformatic workflow that we found genes involved in mitochondrial function. And this was backed up by a functional approach of these, 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 these children having um, altered mitochondrial metabolites that's associated with mitochondrial disease. So that was incredibly interesting and we were very excited. We then also realized that uh, there wasn't much, in fact, there was no methylation data. Ours was the first paper to show that mitochondrial DNA driven by methylation played some part potentially in, 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 in autism etiology. And so we were quite intrigued to work out mitochondrial function is numerous. ATPA production is one of it. So we wanted to look at how did methylation articulate specifically with specific aspects of mitochondrial function. So one of the things that happens in the mitochondria besides ATP, we know mitochondria are crucial for the well-being of the cell, for energy production, is that mitochondria are quite dynamic. They change their shape normally during uh, metabolism, during the cell cycle of the cell. 
And so mitochondria can uh, uh, be um, can undergo fission, which means a large mitochondria can be broken into two mitochondria. And there are specific uh, proteins in play that I'll talk about. And mitochondria can also um, mitochondria can also fuse. Two mitochondria can fuse to form a larger mitochondria. And this fission-fusion balance happens in response to oxidative and energetic stress in a cell. And so cells tend to undergo um, mitochondrial um, fission and fusion depending on the energy status of the cell, but also mitochondria, when they damage, they also undergo uh, fission, they get smaller and they're taken out to the autophagic pathway. And so mitochondrial copy number changes in response to the, to the cell status. And at this stage, we only had DNA from our cohort. And so we looked at copy number. We want to know, was the copy number, which would be a proxy for mitochondrial function and the mitochondrial kind of dysregulation, was it different between our case and control? And indeed, we found that copy number was increased in individuals with autism versus individuals without autism. We use a qPCR assay where we looked at a mitochondrial gene, DNA of a mitochondrial gene versus uh, a nuclear gene. And this for us and for the literature of the field was indicative that there was some dysregulation between case and control, that mitochondrial copy number was increased probably as a compensatory mechanism to um, make more ATP. And so one of the key genes and transcription factors in changing mitochondrial copy number, which is called biogenesis, is a gene called PGC alpha. And it's, it, has a, it has some other functions as well, including fatty acid metabolism, gluconeogenesis, and an antioxidant response. And so we want to know, was our copy number in our cohort changing, and was methylation perhaps a player in changing the expression of PGC alpha um, to change this copy number in our cohort? So this work is all done on our children and the DNA we got from those children. And so this, this approach we use, again, next-gen basulfate sequencing, and this is a, the promoter region of this PGC alpha gene. And this is each site again, each CPG site. And again, we find differential methylation at the promoter region where there's a putative um, transcription factor for CREB. So again, this suggests the differential methylation between case and control is changing expression of PGC alpha. Remember, at this stage, we had no RNA of, from our children. And so this is all DNA-based work um, showing that, and we could show using a bunch of statistical tools that the, there was some correlation between methylation and copy number. We also thought, because it's complex, those, 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 those pathways that regulate fission and fusion um, are incredibly complex. And so we also looked at some other genes and uh, we looked at um, a range of genes, and we couldn't look at all the genes, clearly because of resource constraints like um, cost and time. We also looked at a range of other genes, and the genes in red are the other genes we found that were differentially methylated, specific genes rather than globally for ATP, specific genes that were differentially methylated um, between case and control, and these genes include PGC alpha, as I mentioned, another gene called um, GAB-PA, which is involved in mitochondrial replication and therefore biogenesis, and some genes that were involved in fission and fusion. So what I want to remind you is that these functions are not exclusive of each other. It's the balance that's disturbed. So just because you, you have fusion doesn't mean you can't have fission at the same time as having biogenesis. There are multiple homeostatic mechanisms to keep the mitochondria functioning at an, an optimal level. So at this stage, we were thinking about, so we think we quite clearly showed in our cohort that mitochondrial dysfunction is associated with autism, uh, that it's driven by methylation, that copy number change, that metabolites change, but autism has a strong neurological phenotype. So how does mitochondrial function affect neurogenesis or neuronal kind of phenotypes. And so our data set um, was one data set. And so what we did was um, we then looked at all the data that was available at the time this paper came out in 2021, is there were 15 transcriptomic data sets. Um, and this is data sets from 
mostly the United States. Um, there were, we only looked at primary data sets and there were six proteomic data sets and there were six methylation data sets of which one was ours. And so we looked at these data sets. This is the graphical abstract from the paper. And we reanalyzed those data sets, their gene lists. So we re and we re um, made sure they all spoke at the same annotation to each other. We used hallway pathway analysis. We also looked at the differential expressed genes. We looked at protein protein interactions, and we looked at what were the common pathways. And again, no, 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 spoiler alert. The common pathways across all these data sets were three main functions: mitochondrial dysfunction. Confirming data we found in our South African cohort, neurogenesis, which is the link between mitochondrial function, we think, and neurogenesis, and then neuroinflammation. And so I'll just talk you through some of that. And so um, the whole world, the whole map, canonical pathways most consistently implicated in ASD data, if you look at the top, is we had a number of data sets, both um, colors as for, I can't remember the, oh, there we go, blue is proteomic the gray is transcriptomic, and the dark blue is DNA methylation. So we had a number of data sets that were, excuse me, associated with oxidative phosphorylation. And you can see some of the other pathways. So that, that was actually really nice for us to see that there was congruence across the data sets. And this is not just say some of the other papers didn't see mitochondrial dysfunction, but it wasn't necessarily perhaps their top one or the one they focused on in the, in the original papers. And so we did a little bit more analysis. We did some protein, protein interactions and protein analyses. And we find this combined data set converge on four biological processes. The first being neuronal, neural cell proliferation, just get the cursor going, um, neurogenesis, neuroinflammation, and mitochondrial metabolism. And we found singling pathways that cross talk from this uh, metadata analysis across the different data sets, which was very exciting for us because now it gave us a foot in the door to try and perhaps unpick some of this crosstalk pathways in a model system and see, you know, could we perhaps see evidence of this gene, for example, PPAR gamma, if we could add um, PPAR gamma here, an agonist or an antagonist, could we change aspects of, of neuro Neuro, um, neural stem cell proliferation, or could we uh, look at elements of, let's say, could we change metabolic function and then change neurogenesis? So it gave us a space where we could start generating hypotheses and test them in a cell system. And so there are many cell systems to work with, and one has to be quite careful what you choose and how you start. And again, one's always resource limited. So we decided to use the workhorse um, cell line, the neuronal-like cell line called SHSY. Um, these are neurons that are very well characterized in, for example, Parkinson research, because these are dopaminergic. Um, you can turn, change them or differentiate them into dopaminergic neurons. And we basically um, set up a model where we didn't have the time because i would really lost quite a bit of time with my cold and not getting papers out. Um, we are in the process of trying to silence some of our genes and overexpress them. But a very kind of tractable way to do this was to go back to our favorite gene, PCC, that was implicated in um, three canonical pathways. Um, PCC is a, um, it is, it takes um, propanate, um, it takes, Basically, if you don't, this this first of all, let me just go back. This enzyme is called PCC, and it has two subunits: a PCC A subunit and a PCC B subunit. And the enzyme PCC has natural mutations in the human population and results in a clinical disease called propionic acidemia. And you build up an excess of propionic acid, which is a mitochondrial disease, which also has a neurological phenotype. And so, propionic acid has been used. Um, as a model to recapitulate autism in a rat model system. And they see for what it's worth, rat-like autistic behaviors. And because propionic acid so closely ties to our gene of interest, we added an excess of propionic acid, which we call in PPA as an abbreviation going forward. Um, we add, it's a, it's a short chain 
uh, fatty acid, which is an important intermediate of metabolism. And we add it in the form of sodium propanate to our cells. So we spend quite a lot of time working out which concentrations of propionic acid to add, and then confirming where mitochondrial dysfunction through a number of assays. We've used ATP assay, a ROS assay. We're currently using uh, assays that measure mitochondrial membrane potential. So indeed, when we add a certain concentration of propionic acid, we have a mitochondrial dysfunction phenotype. Now, of course, we don't want to kill the cells. We want a mild dysfunction, and these cells are still um, continuing. And what we're now doing is we're looking at gene expression of key genes in the pathways we're interested to link mitochondrial dysfunction with neurogenesis and cell fate. And so the first um, study that's come out of our lab, and this paper's under review at the moment, in fact, we're doing revisions for the paper, so hopefully the paper will be out shortly, um, is we added propionic acid to model mitochondrial dysfunction, and we looked at the mitochondria under the electron microscope. So remember, mitochondria change shape. They get bigger or smaller, or they increase copy number. And what we can show, this work was done by a master's student, now a PhD student. We can show that this is electron... This is transmission electron microscopy. We can show that when cells are treated with sodium propanate, they become smaller and rounder. And we've measured this looking at area squared. We looked at area, we looked at roundness, we looked at something called Ferret's diameter. So we can unequivocally show that increasing concentration of sodium propanate do indeed induce a mitochondrial dysfunction phenotype and it changes mitochondrial shape. So that was very exciting for us. And so when mitochondria change their shape, there are a number of key players involved in terms of fission and fusion. I've got the right specs and I can't see. In terms of fission and fusion, there are genes that are involved. And I draw your attention to stomach, because one of the genes I told you was the most differentially methylated gene on our cohort. And stomach is thought to play a crucial role in mitochondrial fusion. And then in terms of fission, there are genes like TPR1 and some other genes. And so to try and look at what is happening with our cells under the electron microscope, is that correlated with some change of expression of the genes or key players? And there are numerous genes. So of course, we had to choose a handful of genes. And um, what we found was, um, because there's so many genes we have to look at and we have to think of some cost-benefit costs, what I'm very proud of my lab for doing is we set up a whole bunch of TACMAN assays where we can look at batteries of genes, four or five genes, plus the housekeeping gene in one qPCR using a TACMAN assay. And we did not find any expression changes, and we had, you know, four or five biological repeats for various genes. We did not find any change in expression for the genes that um, were responsible for mitochondrial fusion, that is making mitochondrial bigger. Um, but we, nor do we find any changes in genes that make mitochondrial smaller, which is uh, DPR1. Data is the data. But we did find a decrease in gene expression of stomach. So the gene that normally makes mitochondrial bigger as a compensatory method, if there's dysfunction, that gene was dysregulated. We had less of that gene make, made. And what we're trying to do at the moment is the reviewers ask for some protein data. So we're getting some protein data to back this up. And just before any questions are asked, that we often find that DPR is not changed during mitochondrial uh, fission. It's actually a protein phosphorylation step that changes um, the activity of the protein. So we are going to try and see if we can um, appease the reviewer to and get that data in the next couple of weeks. Okay. And so the other big question we're very interested in asking is sulfate neurodifferentiation. So just to quickly tell you about um, cells, neurons. When neurons become mature neurons from progenitor neurons, you have to have a switch where you make more ATP, where you go from glycolysis to oxphos. And I, I see we're running out of time, so I won't rush. I'll just want to tell you the first thing we have to do in our lab is we had to set up immunocytochemistry showing that we had markers of neuronal differentiation. And so nestin is the mark of undifferentiated neurons and beta-3 tubulin is the mark of differentiated neurons. And what we can show is that the ratio of beta tubulin to nestin does change when we differentiate neurons. So we have to set up those methods from scratch. 
But what we can also show is, I've told you we have pathways we could now test in a very hypothesis-based way. And so I'm not going to go through all the mechanisms here again, but one of the ways that mitochondria changes the number of mitochondria that's made is through this complex feedback loop of a gene called CMIC, which is an instruction factor that modulates the expression of two other genes involved in mitochondrial uh, replication and biogenesis. And we can show really nicely that in our model, when we add mitochondrial dysfunction, we decrease the expression of these genes that lead to this compensatory method. So we're basically compromising this compensatory method when we have mitochondrial dysfunction. The last thing I'm going to show you from this part of our data, and I'm actually hopefully trying to switch uh, fields, uh, uh, switch tack, is that the main thing when neurons differentiate and you don't have enough oxfos is that perhaps you change cell fate and how the neurons behave. And this is some early data we're busy um, trying to redesign with a colleague and collaborator, Karen Jacobs, a macro to measure this. So this is, um, so this is some pictures of phase contrast images of control cells differentiated and differentiated in the third panel in the presence of sodium propanate or when we have mitochondrial dysfunction. And we can show that Mitochondrial dysfunction has been induced by PPA, decreases neurite production, elongation, and branching. So that's very exciting early data for us. And uh, we're still busy analyzing and fine tuning these experiments. And so um, I'm going to skip this slide. I was going to give you guys a quick break. But all I'm to say is autism is so complex to diagnose. How many of you can see that weird rectangle shape? that's on the left and the right. And some of you can see it, I'm sure. And some of you didn't see it as quickly. And autistic individuals generally find it easier to identify that shape. But just because you can identify that shape more quickly than the person in the room next to you does not make you autistic. And this is a challenge we were working with with trying to get what's called a clean phenotype to do case control studies. And this has been the challenge for everybody in the field. So the last bit of work I'm going to tell you about um, is quite complex and quite a complex story. So I'm going to try and walk you through it quite slowly, is getting back to this idea of participatory research and doing what the real questions and difficulties are for individuals who live with an autistic phenotype is, is there any link between any molecular markers and autistic experiences? And obviously, I'm interested in mitochondrial function. And so molecular research is a whole range, increasingly a whole, more individuals who are autistic or are doing autistic research, be it psychology research, be it molecular biology research. And so molecular research is starting to be informed by autistic experiences. So there's a move away from describing autism from the viewpoint of therapists or clinicians or educators or even parents, but the autistic individual themselves. And researchers also, there's, there's a move starting, a movement starting of trying to stop correcting external, what is considered by society, unfavorable autistic behaviors, and really to alleviating internal distress that autistic individuals experience. And so this paper came at late November, and Caitlin and I are very proud of this paper. And this is a paper where we had this hypothesis and we did a deep dive in the literature simulated the literature, and then tried to come up with an hypothesis. And what we did in a nutshell is we looked at the literature around early life stress and chronic adolescent stress. And we also looked at some terms, I'll walk you through it, uh, that autistic individuals are self-describing, terms like social camouflaging and autistic burnout. And this is the psychopathology part. And this together, we posit, results in a dysregulation, a toxic stress or dysregulation, something called an allostatic load, which I'll talk to you about. And we show that this allostatic load crosstalks with a bunch of molecular data, which include mitochondrial um, dysfunction or mitochondrial load, which all adds to this incredible autism psychopathology. And so this is early days, but this literature is quite exciting. As I say, I'm very proud of this paper. This is the first paper where I've had psychiatrists, psychologists, and autistic individuals saying, 
you know, thanks for this paper. This is really interesting. So we are a bit out there, but we think it's a very, very interesting um, idea to follow. So I'm just going to define some, uh, some terms for you. And so we all know what burnout is. We've heard about burnout. It's very much an 80s thing. But, I mean, it's now also a lockdown thing. But autistic burnout is very distinct from regular burnout. It's the inability to maintain basic levels of functioning. And also an increase of individuals' autistic-like traits, which they can normally manage, a dysregulation of the individual. Um, it does align with chronic burnout, but it's distinct from chronic burnout. And it's also distinct from clinical depression. And it's quite important for psychiatrists to recognize autistic burnout as a separate entity. So, um, and then there's also this idea of social camouflaging. And we all think we know what social camouflaging is. You know, we've all gone to that party, that work event we don't want to be at, and it's awkward, but we could have put on our, our big girl pants and, 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 and do what we need to do. However, imagine having to do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all the time, where you need to suppress your inherent nature, your autistic traits or disability, in order to meet societal mainstream expectations of how you're meant to behave because of social reasons, family reasons, educational reasons, vocational reasons. That is what autistic individuals describe as social camouflaging. And there's a different, there are different ways people social camouflage. Autistic individuals camouflage. Um, it's compensation, and you can read the word masking is an important one, where you mask your real inherent character traits and take on this other persona all the time, which is incredibly difficult. And so what we know is that autism spectrum conditions, and in this paper, we use the term autism spectrum conditions to differentiate it from a pathological state, which is autism spectrum disorder, is in, it's associated with increased psychiatric pathologies like generalized anxiety disorder or major depressive disorder. And you can read the list. And the numbers are shocking. For example, in red, that compared to the normal population, Major depressive disorder is six times more prevalent in individuals with autism as young as 10 to 13 years old. Self-harm is greater than two times the normal population and so forth. So individuals with autism spectrum condition carry a much higher psychopathology burden. Those were the comorbidities I spoke about earlier. And so what we posit is that there's a lot of literature on early life stress from human studies, this is on non-autistic individuals, and chronic adolescent stress. Um, again, literature on a lot of on, on humans without having autism. And there's some classical, fantastic seminal work done on a rat and a mouse adolescent model, where they stress these animals and look at outputs of stress. And so we posit that social camouflaging, continual social camouflaging leads to autistic burnout, which leads to increased psychopathology. However, social camouflaging is actually, we posit, a form of early life stress because, you know, you're born with it. And especially at adolescence, all adolescents have a phase of, 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 of dysregulation, but more so for autistic individuals. And so um, with that in mind, I just want to tell you a little bit about mitochondrial allostatic load. So allostasis is really kind of the simplest way to think of it as all the systems in your body, whether it's cortisol, metabolic, immune, to maintain a state of homeostasis. So that's got an easy idea. Allostatic load is the inability to maintain allostasis. So it's a cumulative effect of multiple stresses that's just too much. So that's what an allostatic load is. So what is a mitochondrial allostatic load? A mitochondrial allostatic load is when your mitochondria does not function normally and you have increased ROS, you have less ATP, you have all kinds of issues, and these result in telomere shortening, uh, oxidative stress, apoptosis, you know, systemic inflammation, an altered transcriptome, and I'm starting to show, and many other people are starting to show different altered neuronal fate. fate. But this is called the allostatic load or the mitochondrial allostatic load. And so we found some literature on that. And ultimately, what we posit in our paper is that one can indeed start thinking about a molecular framework for autistic experiences where mitochondrial allostatic load may well be the mediator 
between this camouflaging and increased psychopathology, if we can look at the mitochondrial allostatic load, and I'm not showing you this data, that talks both to the allos, which is a bi-directional interaction with the HPA axis and neuroinflammation, that we may well have found some sort of crosstalk between psychopathology and molecular biology. And this is some ways to addressing the questions of the autistic community of some real participatory research and dealing with issues that are real and lifelong challenges for individuals on the spectrum. So in summary, um, I think that COVID has opened the conversation more broadly about mental health and somewhat normalizes conversations. And that means, us, it means we can talk more openly about mental health and some of the very, very complex comorbidities that co-occur with autism. And therefore, autism research can become more consultative and include conversations with adult autistics and their families. Um, I've shown you some data on epigenetics of the understudied population like South Africa. My study is the first and only study still to date even now that has looked at epigenetics, a whole genome way, um, that it can heal novel um, insights. And specifically, I've shown that mitochondrial dysfunction is an important player in the etiology that contributes to autism um, and therefore neurogenesis. And the literature is growing. Mine's not the only data now. There's a lot of data, and so much so that the premier... Uh, funding bodies, the Simons Foundation, had a call for research on mitochondrial dysfunction and autism. And so there's been a paradigm shift in autism research about not only correcting, this is the more psychiatry and psychology field, of correcting external autistic behaviors, but actually really alleviating um, internal stress. And mitochondrial allostatic load may well be a mediator between autism and its psychopathology. So I thank you for your attention. But I'd like to thank my incredibly hardworking and dedicated team of postgraduate students, interns, and postdoctoral fellows. We've started all this work. Every single thing you've seen, we started from scratch. And I'm very, very grateful and proud of, of my team. And a massive thank you to the funders, but mostly a massive thank to the families and the participants of our studies. So thank you so much. <laughs>